thing, and they left, and they went, and there was no more problem, and everybody went in. We had 21,000. There wasn't one word during this massive rally. But what about the violence, Mr. Then, Trump? Then, uh, well, then a little bit later on, uh, we went uh, to other areas. I mean, we, we went all over, frankly, we went all over Arizona. Uh, and we went to Tucson, and we had some people that wouldn't allow people for the rally into the door. They were making it almost impossible to get in. We had six or 7,000 people at least. We had 2,000 people outside. They wouldn't allow them in. These people are very disruptive people. But does that excuse punching and kicking a protester? Well, you know, he was wearing, he or his partner was wearing a Ku Klux Klan outfit. This happened to be an African-American man who was very, a person at the rally, uh, who was very, very incensed at the fact that somebody, a protester, would be wearing a Ku Klux Klan outfit, and he went... You're pretty well, excuse me, frankly, I think that was a, you know, it was a tough thing to watch, and I watched that. But why would a protester walk into a room with a Ku Klux Klan outfit on? Well, it looked like he was wearing an American flag right there, but does that justify... Well, have you ever seen him, have you ever seen him just before he went up the stairs, uh, him and his partner were wearing, one of them was wearing a Ku Klux Klan outfit. free speech. So you're not going to condemn the protester who kicked and punched? That person. We don't condone violence, and I say it, and we have very little violence, very, very little violence at the rallies. Uh, as I said, in Phoenix, we had 21,000 people. We had, we didn't even have anybody stand up and, and try and disrupt. You know, they're disruptors. And they're really stopping our First Amendment rights. If you think about it, George, they, blo they blocked the road. They put their cars in front of a road. We had thousands and thousands of people wanting to come. They were delayed for an hour because of these protesters. And, you know, at what point do people blame the protesters? These are people that are... So you're blaming the protesters, not the person who actually punched and kicked the protester? No, I'm, I'm saying this. These are professional agitators, and I think that somebody should say that when a road is blocked going into the event, so that people have to wait sometimes hours to get in. I think that's very fair, and there should be blame there, too. When signs are put up, lifted up with tremendous profanity on them, I mean the worst profanity, and you have television cameras all over the place, and people see these signs, I think maybe those people have some blame and should suffer some blame also. Well, you also, we also have seen that video there of your campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, who does appear in that video to grab the collar of the protester, and also your, your private security. Why, why is your campaign manager out in the crowd engaging protesters? This is the second well, incident. Well, you know what, because the security on. at the arena, the police were a little bit lax, and he had signs, they had signs up in that area that were horrendous, that I cannot say what they said on the sign, but the ultimate word, and it was all of the camera, and frankly, the television cameras can't take it, and they can't do anything about it, and I will give him credit, Spirit. Now, he didn't touch, he wasn't... Well, the video does show that he else. touched him. Your private security pulled well, that him. Was somebody else grabbed the I mean, I give, I give him credit for having spirit. He wanted them to take down those horrible, profanity-laced signs. But these are disruptors. If they go into a room with 20,000 people, or they go into a room with six or 7,000 people, and they stand up and they start shouting things, and they... I mean, you know, at some point, somebody should say, I will say this, Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Phoenix arrested three people. As soon as he arrested those three people, everybody else immediately left. Well, but it is, and, and here, it is the job of the police to arrest protesters who are being disruptive, if they are indeed. Well, that happened, that, that, that happened. But you appear to be That worried. happened in the Phoenix area. It didn't happen in Tucson. You appear to be much more upset by the protesters than by the violent response to those protesters. I am very, uh... I wouldn't use the word upset. I think it's very unfair that these really, uh, in many cases, professional, in many cases, sick protesters can put cars on a road blocking thousands of, of great Americans from coming to a speech, and nobody says anything about that, but they'll say something about whatever. I, I will tell you, you it's, it's a very problem. unfair, it's a very, let me just tell you, it's a very unfair double standard. Why don't you mention the fact that people were delayed for an hour to get into an arena in the only road going there, that they were delayed for an hour because people were blocking the road. And why don't you say in Tucson, where the people were blocking the main entrance into the arena. We you showed that right, right, right at the top of the broadcast. But let me, let me move on, because this comes on the heels of you saying this week there could be riots 
uh, in Cleveland. If you entered the Republican convention with more delegates than anyone else, but didn't end up with the nomination, John Kasich called that outrageous. Speaker Paul Ryan has called you out on it as well. Did you go too far there? And if you don't have the 1,237 delegates going to Cleveland, why should you be guaranteed the nomination? Well, I think if I'm a few short and I have, you know, uh, 1,200 or if I have 1,100 and somebody else is at three or four or 500, which is very likely going to be the case, uh, and if I'm a little bit short, and one of the reasons was we had so many candidates. I mean, we started off with 17 candidates, and it came down to, you know, finally it's down to three, frankly, but, you know, there's so many candidates, so it's very hard to get over that number. It's very unfair in a way. But because of the fact that there's so many candidates and so many candidates are grabbing uh, delegates. Now, here's what I say, and now they're out, and now they're out. So I think I will get over that number. I think I may get over that number fairly easily. Uh, Arizona was unbelievable yesterday. Uh, Utah, frankly, was unbelievable the day before. I think we will get over that number with this tremendous spirit about make America great again. I mean, that's the whole thing. We're going to make America great again. But if you don't, there's nothing I will say about it having a multi-dollar conviction, is there? The biggest story in all of politics are the millions of people that are coming out to vote, for me, in all fairness, for the Republican Party. Uh, they're up 75%, 72%, 102% different states in the primaries. And it's the single biggest story worldwide in politics is what's happening at the millions and millions of people that are going out to vote. For me, now I will say this, the Democrats are down 35%, whereas the Republicans are up over 70%, and in some cases much more than that. So I say this, if you're going to disenfranchise all of those people, some of whom have never voted before, and they're 50 years old and older, but if you're going to disenfranchise all of those people, independents, Democrats, you know we have a lot of Democrats coming up, we have a lot of independents coming up. It's okay for you to have people that have to, we, we do have some people that have never voted before. I don't know what, I didn't say, I, all I can say is this, I don't know what's going to happen, but I will say this, you're going to have a lot of very unhappy people. And I think, frankly, for the Republicans to disenfranchise all those people, because if that happens, they're not voting and the Republicans lose. If, they, if the Republicans embrace these great people that are showing up, the Republicans are going to have a massive victory. It's not going to be a, a Mitt Romney slaughter because he was such a bad candidate. The Republicans are going to have a massive victory in November. Will, I can you tell you tell your, will you tell your supporters not to riot if you lose the convention fair and square? Well, I would certainly tell them that. But, you know, look, these people are, are fervent. They are really, they want to see positive things happen for our country. And I would certainly say that. I don't want to see riots. I don't want to see problems. But, you know, you have, you have millions of people we're talking about, George. Millions of additional people have gone. You know, I've gotten more than two million votes more than anybody else. Two million votes more than anybody else. And these are millions of, and that's why I'm leading by so much. I have 21 or 22 states. You have conservatives uh, talking about the possibility of a third party challenge if indeed you do get the nomination in Cleveland. Talked about recruiting someone like Senator Tom Coburn. How worried are you that that would cost the, the election? And have you done anything to try to head that off? Well, if that, now look, if, if they're going to do that, they're going to do that. But then you might as well just hand the election to Hillary Clinton or whoever runs. Because, frankly, uh, the Republicans wouldn't even have 1% of a chance of winning if that's the case. So if they're going to be stupid, and if they're going to do that, instead of embracing these millions of people that are coming in to vote, uh, then they're going to have to do that. And I'll tell you what that's going to mean more than any other thing. It's going to mean four or five justices Super liberal place of the Supreme Court. Our country will never, ever be the same. Over the weekend, uh, you appeared to question the faith of Mitt Romney. And this is the third time in the campaign something like that has happened. I want to play the statements for our viewers right here. I can't believe. Are you sure he's a Mormon? Are we sure? I'm Presbyterian. I mean, Seventh-day Adventist, I don't know about. I just don't know about. But I've never seen anybody that lied as much as Ted Cruz. And he goes around saying he's a Christian. I don't know, you're gonna to have to really study that. You know, after the Pope spoke out about you, you said that no leader should question another person's faith. So why do you keep on doing it? Well, with Mitt Romney,
Brown, first of all, with Mitt Romney, I was saying to the Mormons, the Mormons are very smart people, and I said it in a joking way, but they can take it any way, you can take it any way you want. The Mormons are very smart people. I know many Mormons. I don't think Mitt Romney is a smart person. I never have thought he was a smart person. But the Mormons are very smart people. So I said, you sure he's a Mormon? And I'm not going to change it, because I think Mitt Romney has proven to be not a smart person. Uh, as far as Ted Cruz, he's one of the greatest liars and biggest liars I've ever known. He lies about so much. He lies about things that he shouldn't be lying about. He lies about things that don't matter. So I tell people, and I think that's why Ted Cruz has lost the evangelical vote. Look what he did with Ben Carson, who's endorsed me, a great guy. Look what he did to Ben Carson. He said that Ben Carson in Iowa has left. He's out of the campaign. Vote for me. Thousands of people voted for him because he convinced people that Ben Carson had left the campaign. He knew Ben Carson did not leave the campaign. Well, it, sounds, it sounds like you're not backing down on that at all. Tomorrow, a big speech. You have a big speech tomorrow, speaking with the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. In that speech, will you stand by your pledge to be neutral between Israel and Palestine so you can broker a peace deal? Well, you're going to hear what I'm going to say at the speech, and I'll save it for that. There's nobody more pro-Israel than I am, but you'll hear what I say at the speech, and we'll see what happens. What kind of a deal would be in Israel's interest? I think making a deal would be in Israel's interest. I'll tell you what, I don't know one Jewish person that doesn't want to have a deal. A good deal, a proper deal, but a really good deal. But I would say it's probably one of the toughest deals. Me being a deal maker, it's probably one of the toughest deals in the world to make because there's just so many, there's just so many decades of, of hatred between the two sides. It's probably one of the toughest deals to make if you're a person that prides yourself on being able to get people together. So what is a good deal? I think like it's something, I, I think it's something that we should try very hard to get. And I don't know any Jewish people that don't want to make, they all love to see a deal made. No, they want to have a good deal, not an Obama type deal. They want to have a good deal made. Define a good deal. Well, I'll define that tomorrow because I'll be defining it tomorrow. I'm not going to define it now. I'm going to define it tomorrow. But we would like to see, and everybody would like to see, a real deal be made, not a deal that's going to be broken, a real deal be made, something that can be lasting. And I, if I win, I'm going to be giving that a very good shot. Mr. Trump, thanks for joining us this morning. Okay, thank you very much. Let's get more on this out from the chat.